Welcome to Generosity, Responding to God's Radical Grace and Community. This is study number four, Generosity and Ministry. And we're looking at texts in the Gospel of Luke that teach us about generosity. And today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 9, verse 49, all the way through chapter 10, verse 2. And you know, each time we mention the word generosity, right away we hear that word and we tend to think of money. And each week we start like this, yes, of course if you're generous, you'll be very generous with giving money. But it's possible to be technically generous with our money and not radically generous in our whole soul and being. Today we're looking at being generous with our time and our abilities. It's one of the most valuable non-financial currencies we have in life. We all know our time is very valuable to us. And the Bible says that every Christian, every believer, is primarily not a consumer who comes to get their needs met, but rather a ministry provider, one who has been sent out into the world to serve others. And this passage tells us something about what a spirit of generosity is and what it looks like. Before we get to talking about generosity of money, what is this generosity of spirit and heart? Where does it come from? Well, we're going to look at this passage, but we're going to work uh, through the text backwards. We're going to start first by talking about the last two verses where we see generosity of service. The Lord appointed 72 and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town. Now the significance of verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10 is impossible to fully understand unless you compare them to the first two verses of chapter 9. In the first two verses of chapter 9, Jesus sends out his disciples, the 12 apostles. These are the leaders of the Christian movement, the clergy as it were. And he sends them out to preach and do three things. To preach the gospel, cast out demons, and heal the sick. In other words, they were sent out. They were sent out on a mission to preach the word, to liberate the soul from the things that are enslaving it, and to sustain the needs of the broken and hurting. So those 12 clergy are sent out to do that. Now, in Luke chapter 10, 72 are sent out to do the very same three things. What's, what's that mean? What's the meaning of 72? Well, in Genesis, in chapter 10, after the flood of Noah, there's a list of all the nations on earth, and there's 72 listed. And so the number 72 came to be very symbolic. The number 72 symbolizes completeness, and it means everybody. And so when Jesus sends the clergy out to do these things, to minister, and then later on sends 72 out, it's a way of saying what? What does it mean? It means we're all sent out. Every Christian is a minister. We are all ministers. So that's not those with the title of pastor. The ministry of Jesus, going out and serving people and soul and body, embracing the suffering and bringing the truth, that's every believer's mission. Every believer is sent. Every believer is a, a man or woman on mission. And God calls us to radically in. God calls us radically in to heal us, to bless us, to forgive us, but not just merely for ourselves, but then to send us out to bless and to heal and to forgive others. So every single Christian is a person in mission. So let's look next at uh, verses uh, 57 to 62 in Luke 9 when we see Jesus talking about what it means to follow him. We see Jesus talking about the cost of discipleship, what the cost is of following Jesus. And it's the cost of our time and our energy to serve other people. There are three people who say to Jesus, I will follow you. The first guy says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes, Birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Here's a man who's ready to go, and Jesus is saying, You're going too fast, and you haven't thought this out. Jesus is saying, I'm not the kind of Messiah who's going to save the world through winning elections or through winning battles. He, he wasn't coming as a political leader or a military leader. No, he, Jesus is saying, I'm actually going to save the world by being arrested and condemned. My body will be broken my heart will be broken, and I'll be tortured, and I'll be killed. Are you ready to follow a Messiah like that? It might mean loss. It might mean suffering. And it might mean, at least at what he's hinting at right here, is a lower standard of living. Are you ready for that? Think of the cost of following me. But then the second two people, we'll handle them together. The first one says, Jesus, or Jesus says, follow me. And he says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. 
Another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Okay, so both these people are saying, yes, Lord, I will follow you, Lord. Yes, Jesus, but first my family. Jesus, I'll follow, but first my family. Literally, it says, yes, Lord, but first. If there's a but first with Jesus, then he's not your Lord, because something else is coming first. Something else is your master. Now, when Jesus says, don't go bury your father, or don't go back and say goodbye to your family, we have to be a bit careful here. He's not saying, don't love your parents. What he's saying is, I must come first in your life. Following me is more important than pleasing your family. Jesus is saying, I must come first. And when Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead, what is he talking about here? Well, it's not likely he's talking about the physically dead. Physically dead people cannot bury their own dead. So what's he talking about? Well, he's probably talking about spiritually dead people. A spiritually dead person is a person who is blind and deaf and, and sensitive to spiritual realities. And Jesus is saying, wake up. Yes, you want to follow me, but you don't want to put me first. You want me in your life as a supplement. You don't want me to be the number one thing, the central thing, the only thing that you really live for. And Jesus is saying, if you don't put me first, well, you're, you're blind and deaf to spiritual realities. There's a certain amount of spiritual deadness in your life, or you would see that. If we are ever going to follow Jesus and give ourselves to him, we must give ourselves to Jesus unconditionally. And it's not easy to do. But that's what he's saying here. If you say, I will obey you, but first, or I'll obey you as long as, or I'll obey you if this and this happens, Jesus is saying, okay, whatever's on the other side of that if, whatever's on the other side of as long as, whatever's on the other side of first, that's your real master. The real thing you're living for, and I'm just the add-on. I'm just a means to an end. I'm just a supplement. And Jesus says, that can't be that way. And if you're living like that, and almost all of us are, it's because there's a certain amount of spiritual deadness in us. We'll never make the transition to give ourselves until something happens, some kind of intervention, and we say, how could I have been so blind? I'm hoping for some of you that's happening right now. Now, you're very lucky there's a third point, and let me tell you why, because a lot of you are saying, each point is getting worse. I mean, the first part is hard enough to live for other people, to give my time, to serve others. Well, I guess I'm kind of busy. i kind of selfish. I'm a little self-absorbed. Okay, yeah, I should live for other people. But the second point, it's all or nothing with Jesus. No conditions, no ifs, ands, or buts. No as long as, unconditional, without reservation, holding nothing back, all or nothing. You go, okay, all right, maybe I should do that. I may not always want to. And you know, you don't want to, and I want you to know that You'll not be able to do it just by telling yourself, I just need to be unselfish. You see, generosity is a life of deep unselfishness. That's biblical generosity. I should be unselfish. I should give myself to other people. You can tell yourself that and it'll never happen. Feeling guilty is not going to work over the long haul. So what will? Well, we have to know God's generosity of grace. You know, at the beginning of our passage, the disciples say, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? Now, you know why they were thinking this? I mean, where'd that come from? The disciples knew about an incident in the life of Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament. In 2 Kings 1, Elijah was under arrest. And the king of Israel, who didn't like Elijah, had sent 50 soldiers to arrest him. And twice, 50 soldiers came and tried to arrest Elijah. And Elijah called fire down from heaven. Each time the commander says to Elijah, Man of God, come down. Elijah would say, If I'm a man of God, may fire come down and consume you. And fire came down and destroyed them. And the second group came and they tried to arrest Elijah. And the same thing happened. Now here's what the disciples are saying. If Jesus is greater than Elijah, and he is, and if rejecting Elijah was so terrible that it meant fire would come down, surely re the rejection of Jesus, the ultimate Elijah, the ultimate prophet, the son of God, would warrant this kind of judgment. These people should be judged. Fire should come down. And the fire of God meant the judgment of God. So they said, surely we should call fire down. 
They're defending Jesus. They recognize who Jesus is and that these people just rejected him. But what does Jesus say? It says in our passage, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Now, why this difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament? Why is it Elijah called down fire and Jesus did not? Isn't Jesus greater than Elijah? If rejecting Elijah resulted in judgment, shouldn't it for Jesus? And here's the answer. You know, soldiers did come to arrest Jesus. But what did he do? The soldiers came and they nailed him to a cross, put a thorn of crowns on his head. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Jesus forgives them. Jesus went to the cross, and there on the cross, he took what we deserve. Why is it that Jesus was able to forgive the people who were killing him? Why was he able to forgive the Samaritans that were rejecting him? Because Jesus Christ did not come to bring judgment, he came to bear judgment. He came to take the fire, the judgment that we deserve. And what this means now is if you're a Christian, well, we don't call fire down on anybody. We'll never have the ability to give ourselves to others or Jesus until we see that Jesus first gave himself to us. Jesus gave himself for you. And when we see him doing that for us, then we'll be able to do it for him. How can you come to grips with someone who gave himself utterly for you without giving yourself utterly to him? If the thing in which our whole life is based is a man dying for his enemies, we're not going to call fire down on anybody. We will love even the people who differ with us the most. And then we will know that we are truly his disciples. We look to Jesus, what he's done for us, to find the power to follow him and to serve others.